All right, I think I'm going to go ahead and start. Don't want to keep anybody from their lunch. So, um, my name is Coburn Watson, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, our engineering velocity at Netflix and how we tend to optimize that and try to protect some other goals around uh, resiliency and scalability. So, most people probably know Netflix uh, in one degree or another. So, we have 38 million subscribers in about 40 countries. We launched in the Netherlands this week, and that was great. Um, we have about a billion hours streamed per month of our content, and in the U.S., I think we're approximately 30-ish 30, 30 percent of the nightly traffic in the U.S. Um, we have a bunch of notable things. You know, we're, we're moving more into increased originals, right? So we have House of Cards, Arrested Development, Hemlock Grove, Orange is the New Black, all that stuff within the past year, uh, and it's turning out to be a really good investment for us. Uh, from a technology perspective, we consider ourselves a pretty good contributor to the open source community, particularly in the area of um, like a PaaS for AWS. And then we have some other areas we've diverged into in the past year in terms of like Open Connect. So we have a homegrown CDN that we basically give away free to ISPs um, that want to deliver most of the content in the last mile. In Europe, I think close to 100% of our traffic is served off of our own um, uh, CDN. So I manage the cloud performance team at Netflix. Uh, you know, there's a lot of teams at Netflix. There's the device teams and there's the content teams. All the engineers are in Los Gatos uh, in, in California, so we all work on the same campus. There's nobody in the middle of the country or on the East Coast. Makes it really great for, uh, you know, high efficiency there. Uh, I'm a sub-team of the Cloud Solutions Organization, so one of the key aspects of us in, uh, improving our engineering velocity is to make sure that we make use of the cloud very seamless for our engineers when they come in. We don't want them to have to deal with things like keys and security groups and tweaking stuff and manual launches with commands. Like, our job is to sort of simplify all of that away. I've been working on performance in a dedicated fashion uh, for a little over a decade, mostly at larger enterprise companies, um, uh, dealing with different types of applications. I really enjoy uh, working on performance problems in general. Uh, Netflix is awesome to be at for me. And, um, I'm always looking for great performance engineers, so if you know anybody who's interested in Netflix and interested in performance, uh, please send them off my direction. So I'm going to set some context around how we operate at Netflix real quickly, and that'll help you understand why we, um, we think engineering velocity uh, being optimized is very important to us. So we have a culture deck. I don't know if anybody's ever read our culture deck. It's a little bit long. It's about 120 pages, but it's pretty concise per slide, but I consider it a really good read. Just to get visibility to have a different perspective on how some companies can operate. But one underlying principle is really that if you have good performers, you can get about 2x out of them in terms of productivity and quality. But out of top performers, you get a 10x, right? You want to focus on, um, and I'm sure you all have top performers at your company, and at Netflix we focus on bringing in top performing talent. And so when you bring in top performing talent, um, there's some things that engineers don't like, right? Engineers really don't like processes that are heavy, um, they don't like having to spend a lot of time trying to get their code into production or get it through some process. They don't like restricted access, right? Like, if I need to get root on a box in production, why do I have to go through three change requests just to get on that system? Um, and they don't like restricted technical freedom. You know, we all inherit that somewhat. We have applications that have been running for a while in most cases if it's not uh, completely greenfield. But being able to pick and choose which libraries you want, maybe what, you know, uh, source configuration management tool you want to use, that's really nice. Um, and then it's interesting hearing Gene Kranz talk yesterday because the last one I put in here was lack of trust, right? Like if you're hiring me and you're really saying that I'm an awesome engineer and you trust me with the keys to the castle, um, you know, give them to me. Let me get out there in the environment and have, you know, unhindered access to the environment. And, and so having, well, I'll go more on that. So if you take those dislikes and you sort of remove them, you end up, you know, maximizing your engineering velocity and you also maximize engineering satisfaction, which is something we really keep an eye on at Netflix. We want it to be a great environment uh, for people to work in. So maximizing engineering velocity. How do we do that? Netflix is a, it's a microservice architecture. We have somewhere around probably, I would say, I don't keep track of it, 15 to 20-ish engineering teams. And amongst themselves, they own somewhere in the ballpark of probably 60 to 70 services. Um, we provide implementation freedom, right? So every, every engineering team within Netflix operates completely independently, right? They have the choice over if they want to use Perforce or they want to use Stash. Um, in terms of libraries they use, they even have the choice over which language they want to use, right? They can use Scala, you can do stuff in Python, whatever you want. Now, having said that, um, there are platform benefits that exist, right? So we are primarily a Java shop. We have a lot of work around our cloud solutions as well as around our platform infrastructure that takes a lot of the hassle out of the way into the engineers, right? We have services that handle discovery. 
We have open source libraries like Ribbon that handle IPC and understand how to keep traffic within an availability zone instead of spreading it across, right? Things that if each team had to sit down and really think, well, how am I gonna handle all my REST calls to the subscriber service, it would really be a hassle. So most people end up sticking um, with Java in general because of what's available there. Uh, deployment freedom, right? So every service team owns their push schedule, they own their functionality, and they own their performance, right? So as a performance team, I don't do any performance testing on release, right? It isn't like, hey, you guys are good to go, push it out the door, there's no risk there, right? And most teams push somewhere between every two days and every four weeks, right? And, those, and usually it's a function of the rate of change of the service. So if we have a service that handles your device key as an example, that might change quarterly. And it might just need to change because it needs to incorporate some new libraries. But all the teams also own their operational activities, right? So some cases the teams are small enough, it's just one tiny group of engineers. Other teams actually have a subset of their team carved off, which is sort of their DevOps organization. They probably handle more of the on-call type behavior, the pushing of the code, the rolling it back. But part of the freedom is every team does what they want. And really where we all communicate together uh, is Artifactory, right? You take your assets, you um, check them in, and everybody when they do their builds, we use Jenkins, uh, our dependency management will pull in the various libraries. And that's how you get your assets out there for other people to consume of your service. One thing that I spend a fair amount of time on is uh, providing sort of unconstrained uh, on-demand cloud capacity for all of the teams, right? So we have, you can have thousands of instances at the push of the button. There's no need uh, to go through a procurement process. You can tear them down, stand them up, doesn't really matter. No one's going to have you check a box and say, I need 1,000 servers today, right? So I'm gonna step into that next. Um, so rapid deployment. Most of the environments I've been in before, uh, software shops and other places, I don't know where I got this slide from, but you end up going through a review process, right? So you might be agile, you might be doing you know, Scrum, and then you need to procure some hardware, right? And everything's going really fast and agile until you typically need some servers to run stuff on if you're not in the cloud. And so you're like, well, I need about 10 servers, and you go through the procurement process, um, and then it gets spec'd, and it gets signed, and then it goes to the vendor, and then the hardware shows up, or maybe it doesn't. It shows up at the data center, you find out it's on the floor, you have to have somebody rack and stack it, they have to do the configuration, then Corp has to come in and lay all their antivirus and everything on it and, and other stuff. And so from a rapid deployment perspective, I think it's actually impossible based on the stuff I've, you know, what I've experienced at Netflix, to have rapid deployment or I should say, you know, rapid engineering velocity when you're operating in a infrastructure environment like this. You know, some people have internal clouds and they have that capacity, but not a lot of private clouds, say for instance, have the capacity of AWS. So, my experience is it's usually about three to six months if you get new hardware, and by the time you get it, you often go, damn, I wish I had asked for twice as much, you know, or, or something has changed. So rapid cloud deployment, um, you know, a lot of people are probably on the cloud here. So that's a little screenshot from um, our, our first, one of our first open source offerings called Asgard, which is basically our Amazon web console. And those little boxes up there that say min and desired, that, um, those aren't constrained in any way. And so you basically create a new auto-scaling group, which is a collection of instances running on Amazon on the same code base. And I'll talk about that AMI image ID in a second. But you basically push the button, and in about three to five minutes, you have these 300 instances in this example running on the cloud. And then your code bootstraps, right, because you've baked your code onto the image. And you can do this all day if you want, right? Jenkins, for some of our services, do, you know, are, are cranking these out in the test environment every hour, standing it up, tearing it down and it really affords us an awesome um, deployment uh, capability. So, you know, we've got this great process. You have total freedom about how you want to develop your code, how you want to push your code, how often you want your code to wake you up at night with problems. Um, and then we give you this ability to deploy as much infrastructure as you want on demand, right? We're all actually sharing, on our tens of thousands of Amazon instances, we, um, we all manage it as one reservation pool, right? So if you're a department that's handling subscriber, you don't have to go buy 10 instances, right? It's all one common pool, which adds a little bit diff challenging on the you know, management side, but we tend to maintain enough buffer that it, it doesn't become a problem, and if it does, we just go and talk to various teams. Base AMI, so this is another aspect of um, you know, optimizing how your, uh, your engineers can get their, their uh, code out into the production environment. So we have an open source project called Aminator, uh, and what Aminator does is it basically maintains what you consider like a golden copy of your uh, AMI, and it includes things such as the operating system. We're on a CentOS image, we're moving to Ubuntu. Uh, it includes, you know, Java in most cases. Uh, a lot of people deploy in Tomcat. Um, we have our App Dynamics monitoring agent on there. We have a lot of utilities that do GC and thread dump logging. We have utilities running 
It would automatically rotate your logs off to S3 for you and then, and then truncate it as necessary. Um, we have various memcache side cards and other things. We have health check status. And so it also includes platform libraries. We sort of considered that part of the base AMI, but that really comes in through your, your uh, baking process. So the way you get uh, code into production is you kick off your build. Your build actually has a step at the end using Aminator, which is called a bake. It actually takes the, um, the AMI, are people familiar with Amazon machine instance? Which is, so we already have this pool out on the cloud we're maintaining of these base AMIs. An Aminator basically takes your code, slaps it down on that AMI, and instantiates an ASG based on it, based on the previous screen I showed you. So, you know, of these tens of thousands of instances, they're all pretty much running the exact same thing at the OS and the Java level. Now, you might think, well, that's sort of a constraint for engineers, but it's actually, most engineers find it as a real pleasure because they don't have to mess around with stuff like that. They don't have to mess around with the monitoring component of it. They don't have to mess around with which, you know, having Java on there. And by having people on common versions of things, I, help, I think it helps reduce some of the risk we have. We have enough dependency challenges with various libraries that sneak in there. Um, so you've got your base AMI, and then you need to actually push your code into production. One thing we pride ourselves on is when new engineers come in, we have a basically a Hello Cloud World application that they built, you can build um, automatically. And so most engineers have their first Hello World app up and running in the cloud in about six hours, right? From the time at which they get their ID configured, they bring in some code, they change things, they push a button, and then it goes out through Asgard. So are people familiar with Asgard at all? Okay. Amazon provides you a web management console to manage all of your assets. This is basically our own homegrown uh, web management console. It's very easy to stand up. You can pull it from GitHub. You provide it your uh, you know, uh, EC2 credentials, and automatically all of your assets will show up like your, um, your applications, AMIs. We have concept of a cluster. And so when someone has built their application, they've layered their code down on the AMI, and they actually want to push it out, they'll typically use Asgard either programmatically through a REST interface, or they'll just do it manually in some cases. And you have the ability um, you know, to roll code out, and I'll talk in a bit about the rolling code out and the rolling code back, right? But you're really never upgrading servers, right? You're maintaining mostly stateless services, and you could have multiple instances running, and the teams are responsible for making sure, they're making sure everything's backwards compatible. But you have the ability to, in Asgard, you might have one ASG that's running your code, for instance, say one of our edge services, and it's auto-scaling throughout the day, and the, what the push mechanism does is it will basically automatically take that one auto-scaling group, pin the capacity a little high. You'll do a sequential rolling push, so it'll take your new AMI that comes in. It's already registered on Amazon because of Aminator with your account. You'll inflate a new ASG right alongside it of the same size, and then Asgard will take the responsibility through, um, I'm sorry, Asgard will take the responsibility through Amazon APIs to automatically redirect traffic from either your load balancer or your mid-tier services by talking to our open source uh, discovery service called Eureka. And so in a matter of minutes, everything's pointing to your new code, right? And then if something goes wrong, you hit the other button and it rolls right back, right? So we operate off the model that failure is going to occur, things will make their way into production. You know, if you're pushing code every couple days, you really can't mitigate all the risks. So the most important thing is being able to roll back immediately if you encounter a problem. We have a lot of systems that, um, that let us do that. One key metric is the number of streams people are doing per second uh, <laughs> off, of, off of our system. And for clarification, our, our movies aren't streamed off of um, Amazon. They actually stream off of CDNs. So Amazon is really where your device is talking. You do discovery and you click play, and then we keep track of what's going on. You know, our biggest services each day probably peak at somewhere around you know, 60 to 70,000 requests per second. And so due to the level of instrumentation we have, it's very quick to um, determine if there's deviations in the environment, and that's when people react on it. So we have these abilities where Deploy as much as you want, you know, no approval required. We'll give you the base platform. Don't worry about all the things like monitoring. Use this type of interface to roll things forward and back real quickly. So there's a lot less stress. You, know, you might cause functional problems for a very small percentage of the customers for maybe a few minutes. But um, it's really worth it in most cases just for us to have the appropriate engineering velocity. And on the right there, you can see or not see because it's a very small picture two ASGs running side by side under a cluster, and one's in service and one's out of service. And you can drill down into the instances, and using our utilities I talked about, you can take thread dumps or look at heap pressure, all of that sort of stuff. So the disadvantage of, you know, really this high velocity is if something goes wrong, it goes wrong really fast, right? And so our assumption is situations like this, and I, I read the, 
the little text on this picture and this guy was okay. I think he just went to the hospital, he didn't die. I wasn't gonna show the picture if he died. Um, but as you, as you get this increased velocity and you think about it, you know, your rate of change is going up so quickly and it's across so many services that you have these risks that introduce themselves uh, very easily, right? You have risks to your reliability, your performance, and your scalability. So Netflix is an organization, you know, we recognize this is gonna happen. It's something we need to deal with. And in general, as I show in this relatively ugly graph, um, you have availability up the right side and we have availability goals for our service, right? Availability is a function of how many streams are missed in a given time period and we track that very closely. And then you have your rate of change along the bottom, right? And we try to find the right balance. You want to maintain, if you look at the lower curve, um, you know, say at a midpoint of availability, it allows you a certain rate of change and as you increase that, you start having more impacts on your availability, which as I said, we watch very closely. Um, and you guys might see on you know, Twitter or something when Netflix has a little hiccup. Um, but what we want to do is we basically want to you know, push that curve out because the one thing we don't want to do is compromise engineering velocity in order to improve availability. Basically, that's our last option is to tell engineers they should push code uh, more slowly into production. So that's why the cloud solutions team and other mechanisms, we have incident reviews, we sit down and we talk about it, and you know, our core team, which handles reliability, focuses a lot on how could we have avoided this in the first place. And it never comes up we should push code less frequently, right? It always comes up like, gosh, if I really had that attribute instrumented or if I had taken account of this metric, and then we're, it's just like an improving process over time. So that's, that's the maximizing the engineering velocity, and I would say that most engineers feel they're relatively unconstrained. Um, there is some guidance we give people like, hey, you know, it's going into Friday night on the night of a big originals launch. Why don't you not do a, real, a really big push on our edge service? Now, they can still do it, and they do, um, but we sort of, teams have a little inherent knowledge about what are good times to push and not, and they sort of work around that. Because when you think about outages being as a function of how many streams you missed, you know, if you're in a peak window, you're probably gonna lose a lot of streams very, very quickly. So maximizing reliability, you know, if you guys ever sit in your cars, I, I think I have like a minivan because I have kids, um, and you see little airbag stickers all over the place in the car, and you think, how the hell do they get an airbag on the side of my seat, right? And so Netflix really operates off the model that we will have failures, you know, and, and the difference is, you guys probably heard in physics or something where if you're wearing a seatbelt, your body goes from like 60 to zero over the period of about a foot, right? But if you aren't wearing a seatbelt, you go from 60 to zero in like a quarter of an inch when you hit the glass, right? One of them's a little more stressful than the other. So our goal is really to build the, the me underlying mechanism to allow us to um, absorb failure, and, 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 and through learning, we mitigate it. So. Have people heard of the Simeon Army? This is one of our real popular things we put on the tech blog. So um, it all started with Chaos Monkey, but then it, it moved beyond that. So as we have so many different service teams, we really want to maintain that right level of scalability and reliability. But pushing processes down on those teams to enforce that really doesn't work, right? So we want to, in a somewhat autonomous fashion, um, be able to simulate these types of behaviors, uh, it, cause them to initialize and have them happen all the time so that rather than treating failure as an infrequent occurrence, treat it as something as a common occurrence and make yourself resilient to it. And if anybody's seen Adrian Cockcroft's talks, he really focuses on that and he's helped us make that model happen um, along with the rest of the organization. So we have a latency monkey, right, where we want to simulate what happens to your service when all of your dependencies, which could be anywhere between one to, you know, 30 other services, start having uh, increased latency or they start throwing you errors. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll get in a room and um, usually these exercises don't have to be run very often because your dependencies don't change that much. But we'll get in a room and you have the ability to say, okay, this service is currently providing me an average response time of three milliseconds. Over the period of 10 minutes, I want you to take it up to 30, then 300, then five seconds. Then I want you to start throwing 25% 503s. Then I want you to start, and so we actually simulate this in production. We don't do this during peak. And um, we like to do it during the day when all the engineers are in the office and we do this in prod. And it basically exposes things. I'd say about 80% of the time, there's not a blip, right? There are cases where we're like, damn, we didn't know we had that dependency and stuff starts barfing and then you roll it back real fast. But you get all the stakeholders in the room from the various services who are participating uh, in, in the simulation. So we simulate those. Then we have the Chaos Monkey and Chaos Kong, which initiate failure, right? So Chaos Monkey is something that just goes around and randomly picks instances in Amazon and terminates them, and it runs all day in prod and test. You can opt out of it. I think our Cassandra cluster might have opted out of it at one point, but now Cassandra is not opt out for that. And so we try to maintain every service um, uh, 
opting in to Chaos Monkey, and so stuff's just dying all the time. And if you're on Amazon, you understand things do die all the time anyway, so we're just simulating a little bit more of that. We would rather discover the problem than our end users. Then we take it up a step, right? We have availability zones, which are the equivalent of uh, data centers in a region, and so we simulate an availability zone failure. Now, in some of these cases, we do expect a slight hit on our availability, but it's worth the exercise, and so what we'll do is we'll say, okay, all instances in US East 1E immediately terminate. Now, you can't really tell Amazon, why don't you simulate a big network failure to that data center for us, right? That wouldn't be cool, because something might go wrong. So we, we tweak it as best we can, but we really try to shoot a bunch of things as quickly as possible and prevent ASGs from spawning back into that availability zone. And we've learned a lot through that study. Um, the next step is basically regional level failure, and we haven't got to exercising that yet intentionally, um, but we, uh, we're going to be doing that um, probably within the next six to 12 months, and, um, and that's called, I forget the name of that, that's a, a gorilla of some sort. Um, and then we have a configuration drift monkey that's running every day, right? You have all these service teams checking in their libraries, you have platform checking in new code, we fix bugs, things happen, there's new extensions. And you really don't have time to track all of your dependencies and you don't want to have to check it each day. So um, conformity monkey runs out there and it basically inspects your current AMIs that are running in the various environments and it sends you an email saying, hey, there's a certain level of drift from these certain libraries, platform, or from your dependent services. And you can just reply and say, opt out of it for 30 days or never send me a message again. But most people just keep it in the back of their mind. And then on the next push, they make sure to update their dependencies if they need to. So the Simeon Army is something that really saves us a lot of hassle. It's open, most of them are open sourced, I believe, at this point, except for like, say, uh, Chaos Kong, or uh, yeah, the Kong Gorilla. Um, and we do this in test and production. So the next big thing is if you know failures are gonna happen, you're gonna simulate some subset of them. There's another subset you're probably gonna miss. So when it comes time to determine um, why you're having a failure in production and you have you know, 20-ish teams that are pushing code at a rapid rate, you can imagine how a root cause analysis can become a little bit hairy, right? And our basic assumption is, is that most failures we have in production were triggered uh, by some sort of change. We have a system called Kronos. We haven't open sourced this yet. I believe there is an intention to open source it. But we aggregate significant events, and a significant event from our definition is anything that can really disrupt production service. And so we have all these different sources, uh, and our reliability team helps us build these. So when someone does a push, um, when there's a production change request. So when you push your code to production, there's a little box up at the top, like in Asgard, if you want to make a change, and it requires like a change request number. And most people, just, a lot of people will type in 0000, right? But if you're making something that's significant, we really ask that in JIRA, the teams create a, a change request to say, hey, I'm going to go do a, some modification. And then it goes into there, and they, they paste in the JIRA number. AWS notifications, so when Amazon tells us they're going to be doing some sort of maintenance behavior, whether it's on an instance or on, on some other aspect, like say a firewall, um, we pull that as well. Dynamic property changes, those are really the high risk ones, right? Like if you really want to maybe stop streaming real quickly, you could actually change a property that says like this CDN isn't the right CDN or, or mangle something else. So dynamic property changes, those that are picked up inherently by the applications as they're running are very high risk. And then scaling events, a lot of times our behavior might coincide with someone who has an incorrect auto scaling policy uh, and the workload needs more capacity there. So we have all these interesting sources of change and we implemented a, a real simple REST service and we re create these custom adapters that know how to either push changes as they happen in the system or we just pull them regularly. Like so for JIRA, um, for AWS notifications, we pull various APIs and we update them. And so the teams have uh, this UI um, where it shows all of the change events that have occurred in the exact time at which they occurred. And probably 95% of the time when something goes wrong in production, it coincides very closely with one of these changes. And you see it on like the chat, you know, an IRC or some other place where it's like, hey, someone just did a push. We just had to start having a drop. Um, can, you, uh, can you look into that? And then they revert it. And, and you know, usually something's resolved within say five to 10 minutes. But without, without having good visibility to your audit trail like this, that's very easily accessible by teams, yes? We currently haven't done that. We, I mean, we, our alerting framework is mo mostly tied to like metric changes, to, like give us an early alert that something wrong. Um, but that's a good point. Sometimes teams, uh, since again, since teams can do whatever they want, 
Some teams will take these change events and push them into our primary metric system. So you can actually plot a chart of the push schedule or the number of instances going in and out of discovery, which normally might not be an event we would want to have in the alert matrix, but they can set an alert on it. Right, so we leave it to the teams, um, but usually this interface itself, we try to identify all the points of entry, and in fact, one that popped up recently is when you think about A-B tests, which is really, no changes going to production usually, uh, functionally, unless someone, we've run a test and it showed that it's improved our, our user behavior, right? Um, A-B test allocation can actually function as a risk, right? Someone says, hey, suddenly 20% of this population should receive this new UI on the PS3, right? And so we're like, hey, that could cause a problem, so now we get those feed events in here. So then the, you know, this still is a little bit of manual, like something's happened, let's figure it out. So what are we doing up front to really mitigate risk as code's going in automatically? We realize that every time we have a problem, as I said, we try to figure out how we can improve the process and not get in the way of the engineers. So we have automated canary analysis. And so I used to previously be on the fence on the concept of canaries. Um, of course, I wasn't in environments where you had such a fine ability to maybe send a very small percentage of traffic to one of your, your instances or a small subset of your, your cluster. And so the automated canary analysis is something we're rolling out across various teams, and it lets us identify regression automatically between new and old code. Um, this is really an eye chart, and I apologize for that, but I'll just talk through it real quickly. So when people are doing a push to production, they could use Asgard, they could use Jenkins, you know, Jenkins driving um, Asgard. Asgard's actually being extended. We just talked about it at the um, spring whatever GX conference this week about how we're integrating with Amazon simple workflow. So you can actually tie your entire deployment process together and say, push the new ASG, roll the traffic, wait 30 minutes, check automated canary analysis, tear down the old ASG, send me an email, let me approve the next step. And so we're automating all of that aspect. But automated canary analysis says, hey, I've got my baseline, which is my current production cluster. I've just pushed, pushed in another ASG in the same cluster that's receiving approximately the same level of traffic per instance as the others. I want you to tell me if you think there's risk with this code base. Um, so it'll take about an hour's worth of time. There's multiple classifiers available, but the primary model is you're looking at the ratio of the averages between a given metric on a canary and your baseline. And you're looking at the variance and you're determining if it's significant or not. So we have a monitoring engineering tools team um, and on there, this guy, Simon, who has a background in signal processing, does all this stuff for us, and it's just awesome. Um, and then what it does is it ends up putting it into a bucket. Is it hot, cold, noisy? Is it okay? Um, and then you can have multiple metric collections. You know, teams themselves have a pretty good idea of what they consider high risks. They might say, hey, my dependency commands below me are high risk, or I'm really concerned about my heat pressure. And they can build up their own custom set of metrics and check it into the system. There's also some general ones that are very broad that probably have up to 300 metrics that are evaluated. So given the rate at which we push code and the complexity of the analysis, it's really something you couldn't do manually very easily. And if you did it, you probably wouldn't want to do it every day because it would be a very boring job. So we evaluate the data. We do a roll-up. We can stroll it, you know, sort of roll it up along the dimensions themselves, and then we do the final roll up and, you know, and we determine across the whole deployment, is it high risk or is it low risk? It leverages R behind the scenes. We're in R and batch mode on some instances. This currently isn't open source, but my guess is it brings so much value, it probably will be over time. So here's a quick example, again, sort of an eye chart, but if you had an issue with a canary, you could come into this utility CSI and you could look at the results in their analysis, right? So, Ignoring the first row, the, row the, first, the three rows below the first happen to be the new instances in the canary, and the last row is the baseline, right? So it's the currently running um, ASG in production. The columns are the different dimensions you've selected for comparison. What the canary analysis does is it basically identifies who's running hot, right? So who has an average that's higher than the baseline? It identifies who's okay, right? Hey, based on the variance, this is, this is cool. I'm not going to worry about this. And then it also identifies data that's just too noisy to really consider a signal uh, that we want to use in this analysis. Um, and then cold. And in this case, we didn't have any cold. And then you roll them up, and you, you basically look at the quality of the signal you're getting from each canary. You know, there's a lot of variability on the cloud, and sometimes you can just get a bad instance, right? You don't want it to, to pollute the whole story. So you'll identify those which are okay, those which are noisy, and then you strike the ones that are noisy from your analysis, right? Assuming you still have a pretty good sample set. So teams choose how many instances they want to put in a canary just as a function of, you know, the total percentage of their cluster. 
And then we roll them up for the instances which we still want to take into consideration. And, um, and then we actually do the final roll up, right? And we give you a score, and the score is between zero and one. And basically what we found is that a 0.9 means don't worry about it, let it go. And we're not yet at the point where the deployment systems are automatically pushing the code into production based on this signal. We're starting that like in the next month or so. But we found that if it's above 0.9, statistically, it's a safe push. If it's between like 0.5 and 0.9, it probably means you should go take a look at this dashboard because you might look at it and say, oh, I'm not worried about that. That's off a little bit, no problem, right? It needs a little bit of human interaction. And we'll tune that over time. My guess is over time, we'll get more confidence the scores um, in the scores and go a little bit lower below 0.9 for an automated push. And if it's below 0.5, it probably means you shouldn't even do a push. And you just take that ASG out, go look at the data, and try to figure out what the problem is. So that's really a handy utility. So um, you know, we have the push capability. We have you know, teams are running their unit tests. So even before it gets to a canary, it's passed a whole suite of functional tests, um, maybe some performance tests in certain cases. We have automated canary analysis. We're rolling this across all the teams right now. Um, and then uh, people have heard, you know, Mike Nygaard's bulkhead model, you know, you know, how you protect yourself from service dependencies if they're acting incorrectly, either from a performance or a functional perspective, is you basically say, hey, I'm not going to talk to you for a little while, right? And you throw the circuit open. And you, if you're lucky, you have a fallback, and you say, well, you're coming in for your recommendations tonight on Netflix, so I'm going to show you stuff that's really cool for you and the other people that like stuff like you. But let's say my recommendation service is having a problem. It's backed up or it's having failures. I actually have a fallback to find that says, I'm going to show you a standard set of recommendations. Um, so I'm going to, and, and you guys know all about this, about degrading service uh, gently. But you don't want to fail all of your dependency calls just because somebody's sort of a bad player. So have people heard of Hystrix? Um, great. It, uh, it's available on GitHub. It's, it's written in um, Java. I think there's also a version for, yeah, you can leverage it in Scala as well. But it basically protects you from your downstream service dependencies, and it lets you set up executor service pools like thread pools, or it lets you use semaphores to say, for each of my dependencies I'm calling out to or other services, I have a specific criteria about timeout, about errors, and if either of these are violated, I'm going to throw the circuit open and stop talking to them for a minute. Um, and then after a while, you, 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 know, you set the circuit back again. But there are things, some things that you can't fall back from. You just have to give an error to the user. But that's actually a you know, pretty small subset of things within our environment. So you end up protecting all these different calls. The, the challenge is, and one of the risks I think you have with a framework like this, is even though it gives you a great level of resiliency because your code is changing every day from all these other services who you don't really have control over what they do, it can actually mask things that are starting to build up over time. A lot of performance regression is gradual. You know, a lot of error rates start trickling up, and this will actually hide that from you for a little bit. So don't get too comfortable and use this. It's awesome because your system keeps running when a given service fails, but you might have errors creeping in over time. You probably need to take a look at them. So Hystrix is uh, available. And Ben Christensen from our API team does a lot of talks about that at various conferences. OK, so that's really the reliability aspect of what we're doing better. Pick this up a little bit. So then how do we maximize scalability and performance? And one of the features that helps us probably to the greatest extent in terms of being on the cloud and what we use on Amazon is we, uh, we do dynamic scaling, right? So we have tens of thousands of EC2 instances running a day across many different regions. Um, we auto scale on the order. I think it's more than that now, but it's somewhere between 25 and 3,500 instances a day uh, based on various metrics. We have a new predictive auto scaling algorithm we're starting to work on, and that'll probably be open sourced at some point, developed by a platform and API team. But our largest ASG um, right now is somewhere around 200 to 900 M24 XLs, right? Which on Amazon speak is like um, you know, eight virtual cores, 64 gigs of RAM, and then a bunch of internal uh, uh, drives. I don't, I don't actually remember the storage amount off the top of my head. But that's the degree to which the size of that footprint changes automatically based on some, some metric. So why do we do dynamic scaling, right? Um, we have this improved scalability during unexpected workloads. So you might have a thundering herd. You might have some behavior change, like everybody decides, hey, I'm not going to go to work today because there's a snowstorm in the east or something, and suddenly our demand shoots up a lot. Um, someone also might change the rate of calls into another service, uh, change the performance profile. And so our performance profile in production changes every day, right? Everybody's doing, somebody's doing one push every day and something's changing. And it's the whole model of 
do I really want to sit down and fine tune my entire system for one situation, or am I going to make it self-learning in a sense and more flexible and resilient? And the first model wouldn't work for us at all. So we get these variance and service performance profiles, but because we're running with auto-scaling groups that can grow or shrink with the load, um, and we, we leave a lot of headroom on the top, um, things over time, you won't get woken up at night if suddenly there's a 10% increase in traffic to your service, right? You won't top out, which is really nice uh, to have. And then we want a reactive chain of dependencies. What we found out early on was, you know, we work with the big services um, that are out at the edge, and they, they're really good at growing and shrinking and absorbing this capacity, but they're just passing on that load to their neighbor. So we really had to work all the way down the critical chain of dependencies, which is maybe, you know, 20 to 30 services required for, you know, streaming or something along those lines. It's this reactive chain of dependencies where as the load increases, it works its way in. And I wish I had a graphic that showed how all the services um, scale over time. That would be pretty cool. Um, and then one that I mentioned here, even though it doesn't really affect scalability, is you know, we operate a, a large enough footprint that we basically buy reserved uh, instances from Amazon. Right? We have a large pool of them. Teams share them. When someone does a push, as I mentioned, ASGs go up in size, others shrink. The hours during which we're not using the instances, we probably free up a couple hundred thousand hours of instance time a week, right? And so that's really capacity we've paid for. We get a great discount on it, right? Because it's reserved, but it's wasted system time, right? It, you know, what are you gonna do with it? And so what you do is you get your encoding team and your data science engineering team like, hey, over here, I could really use all those, right? So at night, when our instances are scaling down, um, our DSC team is spinning up their Hadoop EMR activity in that same period to keep it a little bit flat, and that's basically free compute for them. They don't have to go buy that time. Um, and it's an awesome capacity planning problem, but it's uh, learning how to effectively use your unused hours is a, is a nice plus. And people can do experiments in that period too, but it is a huge amount of capacity that you can play around with. Um, so here's an example real quick from production of three services, right, where you have your Netflix users hitting your ELBs, your load balancers, we have our services split across the different availability zones. They primarily communicate with each other within the availability zone, and through our platform libraries, we'll reach across if there's a failure. Teams have their own you know, freedom and responsibility. They pick whatever auto-scaling policy they feel best is for their service. So it might be a resource-related uh, request. It might be something that's request rate-based. You know, request rate is really nice in practice, and we use it a lot, but Request rate is based on what your carrying capacity is for a given instance, right? And that changes a lot. So if you set your request based, if you use request rate based, you have to use things like canary analysis or something else to indicate when your performance profile changes. But these use different policies, different settings. And here's an example of a day in the life, right? So you take these three services, and that's the number of instances running throughout the period of the day. And you can see they scale up at different rates, probably a function of how, either how low they're starting or however someone's defined their scaling policy. My team does a lot of work providing guidance to teams on what good scaling policies are and validating that they're effective. Uh, but again, each team can define whatever their own auto-scaling policy is through, through Asgard. Um, if you take a given service, one of the benefits of dynamic scaling, um, the red line, so the green line on the right axis represents the number of instances, right? So we go from like, whatever it is, 125 up to over 350 in this, no, I'm sorry, 200 to 650, reading on the wrong axis. Uh, the red line represents the average response time that's being served up by this service, and the blue line represents the, um, I think it's the 95th, 90th percentile response time. So what you end up doing is over the period of a day, your workload increases dramatically. Um, in fact, it increases 4.5 times over the period of a day, and our instance counts go up three times but you're maintaining a very consistent performance profile on the service. We have these perturbations around auto-scaling events when the ASG is pretty small, but we make sure that's within an acceptable range. And here's the utilization profile of this service, right? It's somewhere between 25 and 55% throughout the day on each of the instances as we're growing and shrinking it by, you know, um, 3x. It, it runs relatively low because we deploy a model in which we're ready to absorb the loss of an availability zone at any given time. And so we don't run everything hot, right? We can lose an AZ, and we want the remaining service uh, instances to be able to pick up that work immediately. Because you can't scale up instantly, right? You say, give me some more instances. You know, you wait like a minute or two. Then your code has to bootstrap. Um, so uh, it works really well for us. Um, the next thing, so we have dynamic scaling. But you know, I want to talk a little bit about the architectural decisions we put in place that help protect us from an environment where failure happens and performance profiles change rapidly. So Cassandra has been a very good um, storage solution or database for us, right? We run about 50 clusters in production. 
Uh, for most of them, we replicate our activity asynchronously across regions as a backup. Um, we split it across three AZs. We've created an open source framework um, called Astianix, which handles load balancing, either latency aware or not, keeps traffic in AZ if possible, and it knows what the nearest neighbor is that has that portion of the key space. So if you're gonna use Cassandra and you're writing in Java, um, I, and you're on AWS, all these constraints, um, I would recommend that you look at Astianix as a, a data access library. So the, the Cassandra team, what we do is when we're gonna go into a new region or we're gonna change some behavior, is we wanna understand, will our service be able to withstand like a thundering herd scenario, like, hey, suddenly Netflix is free for the world, right? That we probably couldn't support, but um, let's say something significant happens uh, where somebody changes an upstream call, and this isn't uncommon, I'll talk about it in a sec, but you know, the call rate or the, the cardinality of the calls into the system changes dramatically. So the team, this was a couple weeks ago, they took a, you know, set up a 24 node Cassandra SSD cluster, and then they had a mid-tier service of which they had a load test they could run, and they said, well, here's our traffic at peak, what would really happen if we just suddenly hit it with 2x the production load, right? And so they stood up, you know, a few hundred instances um, of the other service and they just, they ran it. And so in about three minutes, they took the read operations on that Cassandra cluster from 30 to 70,000, and they increased the write operations, 750 to 1,500, which wasn't a huge amount, you know, and, and Cassandra's already optimized for writes, so we're actually less concerned about that use case. It's the read use case, which if our caches aren't warm, um, it can be a problem for us. So they ran this test, and the average response time for Cassandra in our environment, you know, is typically sub, sub millisecond, but, um, the 95th percentile of our response time went from like 17 milliseconds to 45 milliseconds, right? And the 99th went from 35 to 80 milliseconds. And so we actually showed that this cluster could withstand an immediate doubling of production traffic, and this was without memcache in front of it, um, and not fall over, and still provide services which probably fall within the range of what the timeouts are at Hystrix for all the services above it. So it's a really awesome study to run. And it's one thing that validates our choice of Cassandra as a great data store, right, is this, this resiliency and the ability to, um, to withstand these bursts in traffic. Next one is EV Cache. So we've open sourced this. Memcache works really well for us. Um, there were some limitations around how it runs on AWS. You know, you need to replicate your data across zones. How do you talk to your local instance? So we built a layer, we sort of extended on top of memcache, so we have an AWS aware memcache solution. Um, and in this example, it was sometime during the day, there was some code change and some service from a push. And over a period of 20 minutes, we had three EV cache instances that were servicing in the ballpark of 60,000 requests per second from the services. And over the period of 20 minutes, it went up to 240,000 requests per second. Um, and in the first you know, few minutes, I could say five minutes, it actually went up. Uh, threefold. And so the thing that was awesome was we absorbed this. The performance problem actually manifested itself upstream in another service because it saturated its pool. But through this period of going up a 4x increase in load, Memcache provided the exact same performance characteristics to all of its dependencies, right? So if you have a tier that's servicing the majority of your reads and you can immediately go to 4x production load on three instances. Now these are small keys, I'll qualify that. Um, that it's not a huge amount of data per service. But, I mean, that's incredible scalability, resiliency in that environment. I use the wrong term here, but um, the scalability as well is, is we scale EV cache out quite a bit, so it is extremely, extremely scalable. But um, I think that's a great benefit for us having that in our environment. And without, you know, it's very difficult when you think about stateless microservice architectures and the number of interaction, interactions required per tier if you don't have components in place like this, right? If you're not getting service times on the order of sub millisecond for a lot of services, uh, then you're forced into the world of having state, right? And the second you're forced in the world of having state, you lose a huge amount of advantages uh, that we currently uh, recognize on the cloud. My team, one of the things we do is we provide a cloud scale load testing solution. It's not real sexy, but I put it, I put it towards in here because it brings significant value to the company. Um, people use JMeter, they create harnesses. We have you know, templates, it could be an HTTP sampler, it could be a Java sampler. Through Jenkins, they can run a load test. Um, Jenkins will fire up a huge amount of load generators, you know, maybe a few hundred. You'll actually tell it what service to run, run what workload to run. You know, as the run is going on and when it's completed, the JMeter uh, systems dump their data into an S3 bucket. 
All the systems are currently being monitored by our Atlas monitoring system. I forget how many metrics we handle a minute on the cloud. It's something like 400 million metrics a minute or something along those lines at peak right now. Um, but it gives you great visibility. Each team can define what metrics they want to be coming out of their JVM, whether it's JMX or you know, something they put in the code themselves. And then we have an analysis engine that will automatically take the results, analyze it, present it through a UI. And people use this to do pre-production load testing. So imagine if you, you're thinking, well, I'm going to push out this new version of my service, and it's somewhat radically different um, in terms of who it talks to, and I would like to do a load test on it. Uh, you know, imagine if you weren't in the cloud environment, your probability of getting an environment to test in is actually anything like production, right? This team, like the team that ran the Cassandra test, they just type in three or 600, and in about five minutes, they have 500 instances running. Then they run this test, and we have no problem. You know, we get in situations where we actually end up needing more JMeter nodes to run the test than the service being exercised because of the work required to handle the processing. Uh, and then this type of testing can be ad hoc or CI based. So ad hoc is where you run, it, you, know, you run it specifically for a certain load and you're doing an analysis and tweaking. We recently launched a new service and they use this to determine what Cassandra configuration they needed, how many nodes, did it have to be SSD or could it be M24XLs with spinning disk? Did they need EV cache? And they ended up being able to blend the right workload and go into production knowing that they could handle everything day one instead of having to sort of guess. And then there's CI-based model where we can tie into Jenkins and we can tie into our other build systems so that each day um, the framework will take your latest AMI, stand up a, a new instance in the ASG, rotate it out with Asgard, run the load test under a moderate level against one container, and then you specify which metrics you think are good indicators of regression, and it will automatically evaluate the old run versus the new run, and if it exceeds the tolerance you specify, you get an email saying, hey, you might have a problem, and usually you'll go run it again. Um, we're still proving this model out. Um, there's a lot of variability in our test environment, and we have to tighten that up a bit. But in general, um, it's really nice to just have that thing running in the background and generating reports and saying, hey, yesterday's build doesn't show significant regression. And it's important as well because many times the regression might not be your regression. It might be the other 10 services you're talking to. Same thing. So you think, well, I didn't push anything. Why should something change? But things are changing all the time. So wrapping it up, my conclusions are, you know, as an organization, we have this luxury. And, you know, it's depending on where you are, too, in the state of your company, right? Um, if you're sort of in a keep the, lights mo you know, keep the lights on mode, you've got a huge established customer base, you know, you really want to favor stability over change, um, then this might not be the right solution for you. But I would say with Netflix, we're not necessarily in a, in a, in a competing area that's sitting still, right? We have a lot of competitors. Uh, we're driving our global expansion. And we feel that from an engineering perspective, maintaining this rapid velocity is really the only way that we can win, right? So what we do is we consistently evolve our architecture. And, and Netflix doesn't like to use processes, but you know when I use processes, it's very broadly, right? It's your build flow. It's your metric alerting thing. It's your canary analysis. All of those improvements we've done over time to help out reliability and performance and scalability have been a function of failures we've had and how we solve those. And so I like saying stateless microservice architectures win because of the companies I've been at before, we haven't had this. And now that we ha I'm working at a company that has this, I've been at Netflix for about a year and a half, it is just awesome, and I see very few downsides to it if you can make this revolution. And it isn't like this was a total greenfield exercise, right? I mean, Netflix used to be a monolithic Java web application about three years, three to four years ago. Everybody was on the same push flow. You had to check your code through all the environments. You would go out to production maybe you know, once every two weeks. But by decoupling and breaking apart all these pieces, you give engineering teams this incredible flexibility. You have the ability to change a very small subset of your environment at any given time, not, not affect everybody. Um, uh, what was the other point I was going to make? Well, I lost it. Uh, remove barriers for engineer, right, um, for the engineering organization. Your last option should really be to reduce the rate of change if possible, and that's what we do. We, you know, I think in the past, any time we've talked about actually reducing the rate of change, it's always the last point in the discussion. And we're willing to absorb a little more risk than do that to the engineering teams, and, and I think they really appreciate it. I think exercising these failure situations and the thundering herd scenarios is something everybody should do if possible. It's obviously much easier in the cloud with some of the capabilities, especially that we, we built. Um, but you never really can sleep well at night unless you know that your environment could perhaps handle a 2x increase. Um, and then Without having these native scaling and resilience factors in the cloud and building our frameworks around how we leverage that, I don't think we could do what we do today, right? If we were in a you know, traditional data center environment, what we do is really gonna, would be very difficult. 
we have a large open source offering. So if you happen to be someone who's evaluating uh, using AWS, you know, we're on AWS right now, and you feel like the barrier to entry is learning out how to deploy an image, how to bake an image, how to stand it up, how to push ASGs, is your barrier to getting there. Um, leverage the stuff we've already built in open source. We have a huge amount of companies. We have companies that are now taking this and porting it to other platforms. That was part of the reason of getting it out there as well. But you don't have to figure it out all yourself. And as an engineer coming into Netflix, you don't have to figure it out all yourself. I don't need to, I don't need to know how to run the command EC2 launch, what, EC2 launch and give it the AMI and the region and the security groups. I want to have my build job run that for me, right? So leverage the stuff that's out there when possible. So we have a, it isn't our movies page, but it's our open source, our, our uh, GitHub location. You can check out all this stuff. I think we've added a little bit over 25 or 30 projects in the past year once we've started. Uh, some of the most recent ones are like denominators. So we actually have a library uh, that Adrian Cole, who works for us now from JCloud's created that lets you do dyna dynamic DNS steering. And it's letting us set up a mechanism where we can fail devices between regions very flexibly. We're going to be working on that over the next year. Great project, stunning colleagues. I you know, invite you to check out our website. We just revamped it. But um, hopefully, you know, what we covered today gives you a little insight into what we do. I know a lot of people go out and talk about how Netflix uh, does things in general. But I thought this was a very pertinent topic for the Surge Conference in terms of the, the, you know, the topics that were presented here today. And that's it. And always keep an eye on our tech blog. We do some cool stuff. There was one that was posted um, a couple weeks ago by Ben Schmaus of our API team on how we automate our push model into the environment. And uh, it's a good, good thing just to keep an eye on. We find it pretty interesting, get a, get a feel for what we're doing. So that's it. Any questions? So the question was, how do we handle QA? Each of the teams is responsible for their own QA. Um, if they're relatively small services, it's probably a responsibility just handled by the engineers on the team. Uh, based on the unit tests they write. And you know the canary analysis, situations like that remove some of the load of people having to be much more airtight about their testing. Some teams do have engineers and tests on them that focus on creating the test cases and running those each day. So it's really every service team can do whatever they want. right? There's no common QA system to sort of get in the way of people going out. And it's that freedom and responsibility. So it's just up to the team how they want to handle it. They are. We have, we have um, yeah, we have a review board for Perforce that people can use. Everything's optional, right? So if your team wants to use Stash, you want to use Perforce, whatever you want your control process to be. By a function of decomposing the organization across engineering teams, there's probably no, and the biggest engineering teams are probably 20 or 30 people, right? The smallest teams are probably like four. And so they're intimate enough that they just define what processes they need, but there's no, you know, I could check in my code and just push it right to production if I wanted to run my service team that way, but I don't think most service teams do. They really try to build up their complement of tests to make sure that there's some sanity to what's going out, but there's not a common, common org doing it. There was a hand over there, yes. Which file system? Luster. Luster. I'm not familiar with that. It could be one of our teams that's using it, you know. As Adrian Cockcroft said, who's our cloud architect, he usually finds out that we've made an architectural change when it's in production. You know, someone will be like, hey, we're using Elasticsearch today. Or, you know, we put Kafka in there to handle this flow or you whatever. And you're like, oh, cool. <laughs> so there's no gateway for architectural changes at Netflix. So I, I'm not sure. Very likely someone's messed around with it. Any other questions? Yes. Right. Right, and we know that everything's going to be down at some point, right? So uh, we make what we do is we usually group back and say, how could we have avoided that failure, right? And we talk to Amazon. You know, we're we're a pretty early customer of theirs. We're a fairly large customer, so we have a lot of inside contacts to talk through. We we sometimes get early notification um, from them when something's going on, but only by minutes, right? Because everybody notices right away. So what we do is we try to determine how we can best mitigate that risk going forward. So one of the things we're doing with releasing this um, DNS steering framework is, you know, we reduce some of our dependency on the ELB tier. We have multiple regions. And so we build layers and we decompose our, our systems in a way and distribute them. So that each time we have a failure, we say, well, how can that not happen again? In the cases where it's significant enough that it causes a problem for us, right? So we sort of try to architect around it, but recognize that there's always a limitation there that we need to overcome. And that, that would be true, I think, of any cloud, cloud
cloud vendor. Even if we had our own data center, <laughs> we'd, have to, we'd have to build around that. Yes? That's a good question, yeah. So do we have teams that are sort of specialized on infrastructure components? There are two teams that are infrastructure focused. We have our cloud database engineering team that manages Cassandra and a small deployment of uh, RDS. Um, and then we have one person that manages the EV cache farm of however many thousands of instances. And so for those infrastructure components, we do have dedicated teams that manage that. And I think that just came out of, you know, we don't want, you know, for the cloud solutions side, like deploying an AMI, it's really easy, right? We can take it and we can wrap the commands. But standing up a new Cassandra cluster correctly, we found that we were shooting ourselves in the foot a little bit. So we have a team that's now experts. We, I think we have a couple committers on it to Cassandra. Um, and they provide, they're a service organization. And, and much like my team, I'm a performance team that can lay down no mandates, right? I can't go to a team and say, thou shalt use, you know, Tomcat, whatever. Thou shalt use this servlet filter chain or this library, right? So. All of the service teams are in a situation where we need to make sure that the ideas we're putting out there and the way we're configuring our services brings value enough through data that people will use us. No one has to use my performance team for anything, right? And it's, it's a nice challenging part of the job. <laughs> and so the, the infrastructure teams have evolved similarly. Any other questions? We're at 12. If you guys have any other questions, just catch me afterwards. All right, thanks. Thanks for coming.